today's session, the Chasing Grace Project and the Power of Community. We're super excited about um, today's uh, session. Uh, community is very important to anitab.org and obviously the South Florida anitab.org community chapter. Um, it's obviously one of our goals to build community for women in tech, so we're super excited um, for today's session and question and answer with our special je uh, guest, Jennifer Clower. So and we'll go ahead. Oh, sorry, we're going to go ahead and sorry. get and kind of go over the agenda. Is it stuck? Are we recording right now? Just we are. to make sure we are. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. No problem. So today's session is a little different than we've done in the past. Um, we're doing it in a Zoom meeting format because we want it to be open and interactive for um, our participants. So we're going to start with some quick opening remarks and some introductions of our special guest. And then we're going to go right into the facilitated Q&A. And of course, just finish up with some closing remarks. Um, housekeeping for today, just so we stay organized. We wanna make sure we use our time wisely. So we're asking everyone to keep themselves muted unless they're speaking and to feel free to turn on the camera if they like. It's really up to them, um, but we want this to be a little bit different. Um, in the past, it's usually just the presenters, but we'd love to see everyone's faces if they feel comfortable with that or even a picture. Um, but what we'll do is Ruth will get us started with some questions that we've come up with for today to, to get the conversation off to a good start. And then we're asking all the participants to go ahead and just put any questions they have in the chat. And between Ruth and myself, we'll facilitate those questions back. And that way we kind of keep um, any background noise from coming in. And what we'll do is we'll ask the participant who has the question to go ahead and unmute themselves and ask the question out to the group. So that's basically the housekeeping for today. So we're good there. Go to the next slide. So again, we're super excited for today. My name is Katie Gittleman. I'm one of the co-leads, the South Florida Anita community chapter. Um, and alongside me is Ruth. Go ahead, Ruth. Hello. Yes, I am one of the co-leaders as well. Um, we're super excited to have Jennifer today. So um, this is our social media accounts. Feel free to, to follow us and, and let, you know, if you have any other questions to reach out to us, we, we welcome any questions and engagement to this South Florida community. And um, I just wanted to introduce our special guest today. We're thrilled that, you know, she can be here with us today because recently, a, a week ago, there was a, a virtual screening of the latest episode um, uh, progress and power of, of community and and we wanted to you know as we started to build this community in South Florida and we're part of an Anita B community group uh, we thought it was an important team and, and there were so many questions uh, you know watching this episode that uh, it applies to all of us so with that I'm going to introduce Jennifer uh, Jennifer is the creator and executive producer of the Chasing Grace Project, one of the most visible platforms in the tech industry, exclusively dedicated to elevating women's voice and advancing a constructive narrative about inclusivity. Jennifer is also the co-founder and CEO of Rethink Media, a communications consultant and content production firm that inspires new way of thinking, sparks action, and affects change for companies and organizations that are redefining the future. In addition, uh, Jennifer is founding uh, team member of the technology industry's most respected consortium, the Linux Foundation. Her career has been dedicated to telling the stories that have defined a generation of technologists. For more than 17 years, Jennifer has been a woman in tech and has been recognized for her storytelling acumen by Business Insider, who ranked her among the best PR people in tech for her video storytelling work. So thank you for being here, Jennifer. Do you want to add any? Any additional awards? Oh, we cannot hear you. There we go. I was, I was following directions and muting myself when I wasn't <laughs> talking. Um, no, nothing to add. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Ruth. It's so nice to be here. This is my favorite thing to do. Uh, I love to screen the episodes, of course, but really chatting with communities all over the world and hearing your questions and and connecting in a very real way on topics that we all care so much about is my favorite thing to do. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So with this, now we're gonna actually go into um, the latest, this is just the trailer of what you know was shown uh, last week. It's a three minutes video, but I thought some of you maybe haven't had the opportunity to see some of Jennifer's work. So this is the opportunity, it's three minutes. And after that, we go into the Q&A. Enjoy. Thank you. 
they say no progress. For you, for me, for us. All the numbers, all the words, the spin makes my head spin. Unattainable, unachievable, unbelievable. But I know better because I know them, all these women. I know because I'm here too in the trenches. We are building, creating, fighting every damn day. Getting sued, going broke, paid less, pushed out, dismissed, unfunded. All because I have a different voice, a different idea, a new idea. So I got sued for gender discrimination, um, for not allowing men into my events. And it happened uh, the day of the Women's March. I came back from marching, had my sign, and a bunch of papers were left on my doorstep. And it was just like, of course, you know. Well played, sirs, well played. I have a male co-founder. And the way that we're perceived, especially when we've gone and fundraised, is very different. I'm called either aggressive or impulsive. He never gets called those, those adjectives. And I do think it's interesting that instead of saying confident or aggressive in a good way, it's seen as a bad thing. You make a step, right, and then there's a retaliation, right? There's people who want to hold on to what they have. They feel like they're losing if a marginalized group is gaining. There is a need for a new type of leadership, a new type of woman uh, in the workplace, and all of us really, really need to say, this is not a rehearsal anymore. We need to act now, and we need to embrace our energy and our uh, voice and our right to you know, speak out. I know I'm not alone because we are each other's stories and each other's power. What happens to you happens to me. So the sense of community is is terrifically important. Um, you know, I think just as human beings, you know, we all want to have that that sense of belonging, which comes with uh, being part of a community. I think also when you're in this community, because there aren't as many of us in it is that we build our own tribes. I have a huge community of women entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs who breathe new kind of life into me um, personally and professionally as I do this. As a woman in tech, you can be anything you want to be. You can be hard. You can be soft, you can be feminine, you can be nice, you can be a hard ass. Uh, it takes all kinds of us to be there and we all need to be there for each other. Adversity will never go away. Progress will never be done. But with each other, we find resilience and we find courage. And in that finding of each other, we find change. That was great. Kind of brings back all the uh, memories from the uh, screening. So, all right. So I think it's my um, favorite trailer. <laughs> it really, it's really good. It's really impactful. Um, Okay, I think we're gonna go into the Q and A. Um, Katie, I'm just gonna uh, stop sharing my screen so we can go into gallery mode and and start having the the conversation, right? Okay. Uh, or should I maybe share my screen like this? No, it makes more sense. Uh, let me just do this. Either way. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Sorry, just make sure.
Hmm. Now, let me just stop us until we can start with the conversation and the questions. I think everybody should be able to, um, if you would like to see everybody on the screen, um, you can uh, use the, on the top, right there's a tile we can you can change the different layouts for a speaker or gallery view so i'm going to keep it as a gallery so i can see everyone's um beautiful faces if you want to use your videos but um, let, let's just start with the the first question um so jennifer tell us about how chasing grace project was born and why you decided to leave corporate to start filming these stories i'm sure i'm not muted okay i'm not muted <laughs> Uh, well, again, thanks for having me, Ruth and Katie. I am so excited to be here chatting with um, the community. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. I hope you saw episode two last week or you've seen it uh, when we've screened it around the world. And if you haven't, hopefully you'll get the chance to in the future. Um, so the Chasing Grace Project, I've been a woman in tech, as, as um, Ruth mentioned, uh, for nearly 20 years now. And um, three or four years ago, I felt like the narrative was lacking a real intimate look at a couple things. One, what were the experiences of women in tech directly from those women in tech, right? Um, and you can't really connect. We all connect online, right, to a certain degree, but there's a whole other level of connection when you see someone on film and you hear their story directly from them. You can see their body language and, and you can get really in depth on their story. Something that we, you know, we find things that we lose in the nuances of comments, right, <laughs> on social media. Um, I also thought that we needed to explore what the challenge was, what the conflict was. I'd read an NC with stat that said there were fewer women in tech than 20 years ago, and it shocked me. I knew there were obviously more, more men than women, but that there were fewer women than there were 20 years ago really concerned me, especially during a time when we're building technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning. And it requires that we all be a part of building those or we actually risk living in a less inclusive world tomorrow than we do today. So we could continue to go backwards. And I thought, wow, something needs to be done. And I'm a storyteller. I believe very strongly in the power of story to change minds and to change culture. And so I went down this path. I, I posted um, a message in a number of women in tech forums that I belong to online, talked about what I thought I wanted to do and invited women to share their stories with me. And I was inundated with responses. And I spent every Friday for about four months from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. interviewing women from around the world. And at the end of those four months, I knew that uh, I, there was no going back. I absolutely had to tell these stories. And so we produced a trailer and, and we released a number of episodes. But our mission really is to recruit and retain women for an industry that desperately needs their contribution. And secondarily, and this kind of happened organically, to give women a platform to be seen and heard for their experiences because there's so much power when you summon the courage to share your story in a very real and vulnerable way. And when people see that and say, me too, right? There's a lot of, we know there's a lot of power in that. So those are the goals of the project and that's kind of how it got started. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. I mean, we all can relate to your story of, you know, there's so many stories, so many things that we can relate to that it, it, when it's like a domino effect, right? When someone shares something and, and, and it speaks volume because then it could be a situation that you experience yourself and how do we connect and bond towards, you know, uh, maybe potential solutions for going forward, right? And we can really gather as a community and, and work towards those um, issues that we can, that we're facing or we, we're being challenged. Um, okay, um, so what is your reaction uh, to the progress and power of community episode? I know there's been uh, some uh, previous screening of this particular episode, right, uh, from view previous viewers. And can you expand on your comment about resistance and challenge that is the rocket fuel for women? <laughs> so yeah, I say often that adversity is rocket fuel for women. Uh, so many women in our industry face adversity, ch face challenge. But in almost, not almost, in every case, um, in every story that I hear, women use that as a kind of rocket fuel to go start a company, go take a different approach on their teams, um, start an initiative, start a community uh, within their company or in the industry. Um, you know, it's, it's about resilience, right? Um, and, and the power of the human spirit to be resilient. And we see that among women in tech 
time and time again. Um, like I said, we don't shy away from conflict or adversity in our episodes. If you've seen the episode, you know that you can kind of get a sense for that in the trailer. And part of that is because I don't believe that we can heal and begin to progress in this regard in the DNI space within our tech industry unless we truly understand what is happening. And like I said, directly from the women who are experiencing it, um, because so far, uh, I might be jumping ahead, Ruth, under questions, but we're not making enough progress, not, not even nearly enough. And so how do we, how do we start to understand what's happening? And, and we, we, we have to confront those issues head on. I make this point because a lot of companies can be uncomfortable with really talking about some of the challenges that, that women and, and other minorities in the workplace are facing. Less and less so, it's becoming a more you know, acceptable conversation, but sometimes it can make them uncomfortable. And I say, let's get comfortable with the uncomfortable. <laughs> Agree. Agree. Okay, so Katie, is there any other questions that we wanna, from the audience that we wanna share at this moment? So I think the one of the first questions that came in was kind of when we started from Sarah. She's a faculty member at the University of Mount um, Union in Ohio. And she, one of the reasons she's joining today is because she's really excited about the project and wanted to learn more. So she was curious how she could learn more about the Chasing Grace project to share back with her students. Well, there's all kinds of ways. <laughs> um, the first step, go to our website, the chasing, chasinggracefilm.com. And you'll see lots of clips there. So there's a trailer for every episode there. There's you know a lot of background about why we're doing this and the stats that I mentioned to kind of give context to why are we doing this and why now and why we believe it's so important. There's also um, a series on the website that profiles different women, short stories. Um, the episodes are not available on the website because we do screen those for a fee and those fees help to underwrite the production of the series. Um, we do offer a nonprofit rate though, so, um, and an academic rate and they're really, and I'm flexible by the way, I discount those rates all the time because I want as many people to see these as possible, but we do need to raise enough money to make them. Um, but yeah, start there. And of course we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and you can always feel free to reach out to me directly. I think my information, my LinkedIn, and then a couple other ways to reach me are on one of the slides. I, I don't know if that'll be provided in follow-up, but feel yeah. free to reach out so to me directly. For everyone that has registered to today's session, we're gonna be sending a PDF with uh, a Jennifer's LinkedIn and, and, and Twitter account. So, you know, you can reach out to her directly as well. Awesome, Sarah, was there anything else you wanted to put out there? Any other questions? I see your thumbs up, so I'm thinking you're good, but I wanna give you the opportunity to unmute and ask anything else. Oh, there she is. And now we'll <laughs> full force here with the camera and all. Um, this is awesome, even just that trailer, because being an academic and being a computing professor within the academic environment, I started at this new institution this last year and all my colleagues kept saying is, Sarah, I am so sorry, nobody has ever dealt with this, but I'm also the first female in this role in computer science in probably 15 years. So this generation hasn't been exposed, at least at our small little institution. And my colleagues just don't know how to handle it. Um, two of them have re since retired and um, the other one, he just, he doesn't, he's been blown away by the reaction. Same situation. He's like, that's not how they react or respond. I keep coming back to it is related to my gender and my, the perception that I'm a new professor. They don't take the time to actually give me the credit for my experience. And so I guess I can't wait to find a way to screen that because it sounds like it's exactly what I need to watch. So thank you for this. My pleasure. Thanks so much for sharing. I think that's, you know, like I said, there's power in sharing. Thank you. And I'm sure everybody else loves to hear your experience and can relate. Um, by the way, thank you for the work you're doing because the work at the university level is so, so important. I've interviewed lots of women about their experiences at university, particularly in computer science, and it's challenging. And a lot of women, that's where they, that's where they drop out or change majors. So s keep doing the work you're doing. It's so important. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Katie, anything else? Or should I continue with the um, facilitator questions? Gohan, let's continue with the questions and I encourage everyone as you're thinking of ideas or you have questions or thoughts, please share them in the chat and Ruth, you can just come back to me or I'll interject if I have anything, but right now I don't have any questions. 
Cool. Yeah, I think that that's good. Honestly, to everyone that had attended, thank you for being here. We created this interactive and intimate session for everybody to to feel comfortable and, and to talk and, and, and share and ask questions, right? So we haven't done that with this particular community group. Uh, and we wanted to have this uh, more human uh, opportunity for us to connect. Um, Okay, so the next question, what does community mean to you, Jennifer? And what do you think there's, a, if there's a specific roles or goals that a community should provide? Community for me is uh, I, just everything I do <laughs> it has that in mind. You know, I feel like, um, so you mentioned that I left corporate life and started my own business. I did that a few years ago and I'd had female and male colleagues all throughout the years my 15, 16, 17 years at that point. And when I went out on my own, I, I was so overjoyed by the women in particular who showed up for me, um, just in offering their support and offering resources, their time, um, who helped to advocate for this project when I started it and nobody knew anything about it yet. Um, and time and time again, there was a very consistent thread. It was women in my networks who were doing that. And I started to form a community, uh, my own community, but it expanded to become the Chasing Grace community. And I, I, I consider all of you now a part of the Chasing Grace community. Um, and that has just, it's, it's been another rocket fuel for me. Uh, and I don't know what I would do without my community. My technical background is in the open source software community. And so, you know, that software development community is distributed all over the world. We connect and build mostly, you know, all, almost all exclusively online. Um, and so I, that's kind of in my, my work DNA is this idea of collaboration and connection and community. So to me, my career begins and ends with community. There is not, there is no career without community. So, and I think, you know, we decided to explore this in the Chasing Grace project in episode two, because organized communities of women like yours, like women who code, like affinity groups within organizations didn't really start to exist until about five years ago. Some of them date back to like 2011, 2012, but they're fairly new. And I think they are making a difference. I think they're really making a difference. So anyways, community is incredibly important. In terms of goals that communities um, can consider establishing, I think, you know, number one is, um, support, right? Whether that's through, so, so supporting each other in your careers. So having programs where there are ways for women to connect with other women one-on-one, -on -one, like that they had an issue at work and they don't feel like they can go to their HR department or their boss yet, they have someone within that community that they know is their ally that they can go talk to. Um, so whether that's a mentorship or a sponsorship program, we can talk about the differences in those things. Um, I think that is really, really key. And and also education, but not just education in terms of training around technology or, or things like that, but training in terms of, you know, how do I ask for promotion? What is pay equality? What does that mean? And what does that look like? And how do I make sure I'm getting mine? You know, um, those types of topics. So education and training, but not just technical education and training, you know, career advancement, career development. Um, and then just an, I think you have to bake this into the culture of your community and there's different ways to do this, but making sure that transparency is paramount and a safe space is established. Safe space is such an interesting word, right? When people say that, I'm always curious what they mean. But what I mean when I say safe space is the ability for me to be myself, to be a woman, right? To not have to have masculine attributes like maybe some of us sometimes feel like we have to have in the office, right? But actually be ourselves, allow ourselves to be vulnerable, allow ourselves to be seen, because at the fundamental level, we are all just humans and we're all just like those five-year-old versions of ourselves <laughs> running around, yes. right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, something like you said, bring your authentic self to work, right? That's very important. And, and not only to work, to your personal life, that, that, you know, being yourself and being comfortable in your own skin is very important. Um, when we talk about women in tech, you know, even though we're talking about computer science students and more technical roles, that doesn't really apply. The doesn't, what I wanted to say is, is we in women in tech is, has to be inclusive because we have a lot of other roles within the organization. Because we, work, we work for a company that is, that's, you know, uh, uh, software products or services. 
uh, we're still working for a technology company, right? So whoever can relate and, and to that terminology of women in tech, just to, to make sure that everybody's aware, right? We are a community and we bring different skill sets and we bring different um, challenges. And, and But that's that's why we're building this community to kind of really share and, 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 and learn from these things, right? And, mm -hmm. and collaborate and get better at, you know, at, uh, at well, getting out of, you know, finding solutions for issues that are probably, um, you know, we're facing day by day, really. Um, okay. I, it's, an I, gonna... it's an important point, Ruth. I just want to underscore that. That's a really important point. Women in tech doesn't necessarily mean that, it doesn't mean that all women are technical or computer science, like you say. And, and when I was first starting the project and seeking input from people I respected, a number of people told me that it should focus just on technical women. And I said, no. No, absolutely not. It should be any woman who is contributing to the area of technology. And I mean, I'm a communications person, right? Um, I've come from the open source community where I've learned a lot of technical details and I've had to tell those stories, but every contribution is important. I think that's a really important point. Thank you. Um, okay, um, we're gonna go into the episode. Um, during the episode, Michelle Widerman from Dell shared that her company has the goal to achieve 50% women parity across the entire organization by the year of 2030. In addition, Dell is planning three top initiatives on conscious bias, harassment, microaggression, and privileged trainings. Um, so the question to you is, are you aware of similar examples? And if so, can you share what those strategic measurements are for those other tech companies? So I'm starting, I, I'm starting to see measurement more often, not often enough. I really do believe that we're not going to see enough progress until we start to measure it, right? We all work in the business world, and if it's not measurable, it doesn't get attention. And so we have to begin measuring uh, these types of efforts. And frankly, that measurement needs to be at the top, in my opinion. I think CEOs need to be held accountable to certain measurements around DNI. Um, and those measurements, we could talk about for a while, what should those measurements be, but until the chief executive is held accountable for them, I, I don't think we'll see as much progress as we should. Um, in terms of the types of things that I'm seeing, uh, like you mentioned, Michelle at Del Boomi mentioned those things. One of the things I did like seeing is beyond just like, do we have, you know, 50-50 female male leaders, you know, um, beyond just like number of hires and recruits, I've seen how many women we're getting certified on a certain cloud platform or so certifications among women. I like that a lot because it's more specific and it shows a real commitment to the advancement of women in their roles. So whether they are a technical you know, contributor or a non-technical contributor, what kinds of certifications training you know, do they need and making sure that you're investing in those opportunities for women as much as you are for men. So that's one really, really important example. And I'll leave it at that because I believe in the power of one and we remember that. So that one's really important. <laughs> no, I like that. I believe that, yeah, certifications, anything, that, right? Like if the companies can really invest on uh, helping right. employees to really get a skill set, new skill sets or opportunities to learn new things. Because I think honestly, everybody can learn, right? And, and if I know something, that means the other person probably will be able to learn that in training or so on. So um, yeah, I, when sometimes I get my, my colleagues saying, hey, I didn't apply for this particular role because I, I just didn't feel that I was ready. I needed to have additional training. And I said, yeah, but you can learn on, on, along the way as well. It's not just that you need to know from the get-go, right? It's, it's getting your feet wet and taking the risk and saying, you know what, I'll learn and I'll, I'll make sure that I'm, I'm ready for, you know, this, um, these responsibilities that are, you know, uh, for, with this particular role. But I think I believe in, in learning and I, I think what you mentioned is very, very powerful. Um, Katie, T, anything else? Um, do you guys have any, we want to bring up a, a audience question? Don't have any questions right now. Everybody's quiet and silent, okay. Hey, anything else that you want to add, Katie? Oh, hey, Martha, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, actually, something that stuck um, from the initial interaction with Sarah, that stuck in my head, and it's not so much workplace, but are you, Jennifer, doing anything um, with the communities like prior to the um, 
professional environment, so the high schools or the colleges, um, to get the communities of women and support going there so that more females are um, being exposed to computer science or to those other types of roles that could support um, you know, technical innovations in the future. Yeah, so we have considered doing an episode focused on um, as early as elementary school, uh, elementary school, mm -hmm. middle school, high school, college, the types of communities and programs um, and, and the impact that those have on the numbers, on how many women actually decide to go all the way through and choose a job in tech. We haven't done that episode yet, but it's one that's on the top of our list. Um, and there are a number of organizations focused there, um, Girls Who Code and so many others. Uh, that's one of the more well-known ones, but uh, it's important work. One of, the, one of the things that I've learned through my research is, you know, why are so many women leaving the tech industry? And there's a lot of theories. The number one theory is the culture. The culture in tech over the last 15 to 20 years has become pretty exclusive. And largely there's this huge perception around in particular, white men like Mark Zuckerberg, it kind of is the, you know, the mm -hmm. icon of the tech space and the intensity and the, the things that just kind of turn women off. But another theory is that in the 80s, when there were a lot of women in tech more than now, um, young girls uh, in their homes weren't as exposed to computers and video games as their brothers were. There's even an anecdote I read on NPR where the computer was in a room with a lock and key and the only people who had the, the key was the dad and the son. The, the mom and the, and the daughter did not have access to the room. Wow. But anyway, so all of the, the, the introduction of the PC and video games into the homes were largely marketed to boys and men. And so by the time women got to college and into particular in computer science programs, but other technical programs um, in like the 90s and early 2000s, they were behind their male counterparts and a lot of them started to drop out um, because they just didn't feel like they could keep up um, with the boys who had had so much more just hands-on experience with these things. So it's a really, really, really important topic. Um, one that I think could use more focus. Um, so like I said, we've, we've considered an episode on that. That's great. I feel like that kind of brings it full circle, right? Because you've, you've got to start early. <laughs> Yeah, yes, thank you. I agree. Mm -hmm. Of course. And I think something, you know, in addition is how do we make sure that this young generation are aware of the potential issues or, you know, challenges that they might face? How do we make sure that they are ready, you know, for the fight, right? And, and, then, and then kind of make sure that we share those uh, lessons that we, you know, uh, our generation has faced for them to be strong and more you know, uh, have the, that in advantage and to be able to succeed, right? So I think that's very important to start from the foundation. Yeah, it's one of the reasons, it's another one of the reasons that we don't shy away from conflict is um, like so many women I've talked to echo what you've just, what you've just said. I don't want to put a rose tint on it because I want young women to be prepared for what they're going to encounter, but want to do it anyways. Because I'll tell you when I did those interviews, those for, for those four months on Fridays, every single woman I talked to, and I talked to a lot of women, loved tech, loved to be here, wanted to build, wanted to contribute, but every single one of them had thought about leaving the industry. And so there's a passion and a desire, you know, to do this work. Um, but we can't be um, Pollyanna, if you will, about, about um, the challenges we face. And, you know, there's a narrative shift happening across the United States and I, and I think across the world about what it means to be a woman and other, and other minorities um, in the world, but also in the workplace. And so I hope that young people will grow up with that knowledge um, and, and understand that. Uh, that. That might be changing. I'm optimistic. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I mean, I'm gonna go into a, a, a different question now uh, because- Ruth, real in, quick. In, yes. Ruth, we have a couple of questions. So uh, Lisa, okay, go ahead. Our, our counterparts across the ocean, and it's much later where Lisa is, she wanted to kind of chime in on the conversation and then Rutui, I think I'm saying her name right, wants to jump in afterwards. So go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so I'm actually in London. So I'm, I'm Lisa. Uh, yeah, so I'm one of the, um, the leaders of the London chapter. Now it's interesting what you said about the um, young women, um, not where the room was locked, because 
one of the things is that for me, I'm one of four girls and I went to um, single sex school as well. And I've met other women and I've worked, I don't look it, but I'm, I'm 52. So I've worked in tech for a long time. Now, one of the things that um, I know is that a lot of the women that, um, that have kind of stayed in it, to a certain extent, who I've met over the years, a lot of them went to similar um, kind of things where they went to a single sex school. Um, my dad encouraged us, um, one of four girls, and um, he bought us a home computer, a Commodore 64, but right? a lot of people won't even know what that is. Um, so <laughs> it's interesting what you, you said about the fact with the, the computer science, it's always been an issue. I don't think it's actually really changed, to be honest with you. When I did my degree back, whenever that was, um there was 10 girls that finished the course out of 70 um um not many joined anyway so i did computer science um and i've steadily seen the number of women decrease and one of the problems i think as well is that yes you don't get girls doing it and it's still considered as being a very male dominated thing the stereotypes still exist they exist globally, but it really depends on where you go. Because I think if you go to the countries which are called so-called developing countries, which I hate using that term, there's a different shift. What you see there with the technology um, in that there's not, because of like of the social economic elements, you tend to see that it's have got a fairer balance. Whereas when you go to so-called westernized countries, that's uh, that's my personal opinion I, I think you see the the imbalance and um it is interesting that um one of the things that hi has highlighted these um i would say imbalances is the covid19 aspect um what's going on in the world and it has kind of highlighted the fact that um a lot of women um in other countries are doing tech that are the ones that are supposed to not be doing, not meant to be there in terms of, you know, uh, the GDP, but the countries that are meant to be up there are the ones where people are, you're seeing women vocally, more vo being more vocal and talking about what's going on. So I don't know, it, it's, in, it's interesting because I did watch the video that I watched the, um, the, um, the episode and okay. um, it was interesting to watch that because some of the things that happen in the, the US, because obviously everyone talks about, you know, what's going on and it has impacted the rest of the world. The difference, I think, in the UK for us is that we're not seen as an F, we're not seen as um, coming from a different country before being British, which has an impact on how people react and yes you still have the inequalities that go on for women in tech but women here are more projectified by what they look like hmm. yeah i think that global perspective and, and regional perspective and kind of yeah. this holistic then global perspective is an important one too i've I've tried to um, find a sponsor to help me produce overseas because it's expensive. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think I appreciate your insights because that, that's helpful for me. Okay, cool, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. We have another question and I'm probably not saying your name right. Is it Rutu? Oh yeah. Right, right. Yeah, this right, is Ritu awesome. here. Uh, hi, thanks. Thanks for letting me in. Uh, I'm, I feel really fortunate to participate in this community discussion and event. This is the first time that I'm doing this. Uh, uh, I am, I, uh, I'm doing my master's from uh, uh, Institute uh, Triple IT Hyderabad. And uh, like it has been like after a long time, I worked for quite a while, like around 10, 12 years. And then I have got back to study. So uh, what I realized is that like during my work, uh, when I was working, when I was working in organizations, companies, uh, uh, finding a community like this or reaching out to other uh, fellow uh, females or uh, people with whom, who, with whom we would like to connect and uh, we contribute and grow together. That was very hard for 
for me as this was my experience but when i come back to college i see that uh, these kind of things like learning uh, contributing learning together and uh, exposure to lot of different activities like say this grass this base hopper or any such community uh, activity or even those kind of information or those kind of awareness was missing when i was in in when i was not in college so um, is is this the same experience with others like we get far more information and far more support when we are in college than at work or is this is specific to me i just want to know because i feel a large like a strikingly large difference in my case so and i feel like i have missed a lot <laughs> in in all this while so i actually find that kind of interesting so i'm probably one of the few people in this conversation that is not really in tech i work at a university in in fort lauderdale and i support um the college of computing and engineering and my whole role is to do this is to all of our students um obviously i have a passion for women in tech um but you know all students you know of all backgrounds to get them ready to get into so yeah i think one of the roles of universities and sarah as a faculty member is the same thing um, that I do, encouraging your students to get out there, not just do what's in the classroom. It's very important for them to learn what's in the classroom because they need those technical skills. That's where they're going to learn that. But it's everything else they do outside. So like my role purely at the institution is to create community, connect our students, bring people into the university. So universities, American universities, like that's a huge focus for them. Um, the generation that's coming out is very different um, then I think previous generations, they, the Gen Z, um, we did a I Am Remarkable session. I think it's been like almost two years. We did a student focus one. None of these students see themselves from a women's perspective of being unequal to their counterparts. They didn't really see that this was going to be an issue for them to enter the workforce, which I thought was really, really interesting. They're like, I've never experienced that. They don't sit in a classroom with their male students necessarily, they realize they're they're like maybe the only female student or the less of them, but they don't feel different um, or feel like there's an inequity yet. And I think it's a generational thing. So it's very interesting. So yes, universities are obviously sheltering them, but we're throwing tons of information out them because that's our job, right? Our job is to give them everything they need and then they got to figure it out on their own. So I definitely think there is a lot of resources from universities. Some do it better than others, obviously, um, but there is a lot of support that comes at the university. And I just know that because that's my job for, for where I make at least. So, yeah, so just to kind of add to that, Katie is actually an advocate for STEM programs and really helps to partner with organizations that, you know, can um, bring the technical skills in the university into run hackathons and things like that. So. It is interesting what she just shared because it's true when we had this, uh, we were having a self promotion workshop with these students and for them they're like, oh no, that's that is statistics doesn't apply to me. They haven't really faced that yet because they the two students right they haven't been in the in the in the corporate uh, organizations and um, and that's what we're that's what I'm saying here is like, the more we share, the more I going to be pre they're going to be prepared and they're going to be sticking around longer because they know what is coming and then it shouldn't be a surprise to them so Jennifer I know you want to add something like yeah I'm just nodding my head because one of the another reason why I started the project is because I felt that way at university too I mean I studied journalism but um I my parents taught me that I could be anything I wanted to be and do anything I wanted to do university I felt equal to my male counterparts um, and so when I got into the workforce and things started to happen, I was like shocked and I was kind of taken aback, like, wait a minute, what's happening here and why are these things happening? I thought this was like something that happened 50 years ago. Um, and then a lot of women I talked to have had similar experiences, especially women who are like kind of mid career right now. Right. Um, and I, th I think what that underscores is every generation is very different when I've interviewed women who are in their 60s um, for you know the project they have a very different perspective than women in their 40s and again women in their 20s have a very different perspective I think things are getting better but I think that to Ruth's point we made this point earlier right just making sure that 
um, they're not so shocked <laughs> that they leave, <laughs> right? right. Um, in episode three, one of the women that we interviewed talks a lot about this, a lot about, you know, I don't want them to be shocked in college and change their major or in, you know, when they get to the workforce and they decide to go do something else. Cool. Um, Katie, I'll any other questions? Out, yeah, I'm just going to okay. point out real quick that so Sarah just brought that up, Jennifer. So she's watched uh, season three. She brought up that exact example. Um, and then Francis just threw in a question. Francis, you want to go ahead and bring it to the group? Hi, yeah, sure. I'll just ask it out loud. Um, I was wondering, you know, we've, we're kind of talking about the beginnings of getting into the industry and how, you know, that affects just the sheer population of women in technology or around technology in general. But I've heard of this concept of the leaky pipeline. And I was wondering through your work, um, what are the major challenges and hopefully resolutions you've seen uh, for keeping women in the industry once they're in it? Yeah, um, for keeping women in the industry once they're in it. There's a few things. One is having a, a community for, for women. So that kind of underscores the whole topic here, right? I've talked to women at large companies who are on engineering teams. Um, I talked to a hardware company, a number of women there who had met, had, didn't know they, the, other, the other women existed until they started a community at their office. So, these women were the only women on their engineering teams and they didn't have other women to connect to or have lunch with or, you know, sh compare notes about their experiences until one of them posted something on like the, in the intranet at their company and was like, oh, there's other women just like me at this company. They didn't even know that. So I think part of retention is like finding, <laughs> finding the other women at your company and creating community. Um, I think your point about, you know, when they leave the workforce to have children and come back, that is a serious, serious, serious issue. Um, it's the number one reason cited for the pay gap is that uh, there's a thing actually even called the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood bonus. Men start to, men tend to get promotions and bigger raises when they're fathers. And women, um, there's a statistic and I, I will misstate it right now, but Claire Wasserman of Ladies Get Paid um, has it at the ready all the time, but there's a certain percentage of, of pay lost per kid that a woman has over the course of her career. So these, and, and a lot of women then end up being like, well, the cost of childcare versus what I'm being paid at work is not really worth it. I'm not going to go back. Um, it's something that every country, I think, has to deal with at the policy level. Um, and in the United States, that's not happening right now. Um, there's efforts underway, but unfortunately, they're not seeing enough. Um, they're not making enough progress to use one of the words in our episode so it's a serious issue very serious issue yeah, yeah, but I, I can, go ahead ruth go ahead it, just to i guess amplify that message uh, community means right women in tech means motherhood uh women careers right moms uh, women leadership the groups uh professional development groups right it's, it can be different different ways of getting uh you know a group of people that you have the same interests and the same passions that you can share and, and can grow together. So it's not just women in tech. I think there's, there's more that you, we can, you know, uh, see in our organizations and create those type of groups if there's not a formal program at your organization. I was just gonna, sorry, point out, um, I was thinking, cause she had mentioned like having children, but like that we've talked, Jennifer, Ruth and I about sponsorship versus mentorship. Um, that being another way to help you kind of promote yourself with an organization. Yeah, I think we can jump into that question. Let's let's go for that one. Um, so yes, all panelists, right, in the episode two, uh, share that they have exclusively worked for a male leader, and in order to progress in their careers, they had to, you know, to receive some type of a sponsorship. So I'm actually being part of the McKinsey uh, program and we, we went through six weeks of uh, training to understand how we can unlock the potential of women. And within this research, five years of research, they highlight the difference and the benefit of both mentors and sponsors. So there's a very distinct differentiation between the both of them. Mentors generally provide advice and guidance while sponsors create new opportunities helping to carve successful career path for the prodigy. So with that, uh, I want to ask Jennifer, do you have any recommendations to start a sponsorship program internally, internally at any company? 
you know, I haven't seen sponsorship programs formalized. I haven't seen that. So I'd be curious to hear from this group if there's any formalized sponsorship programs at your companies. Uh, the difference for me and what I've learned through the project and interviewing women and managers between a mentor and a sponsor is a mentor exactly gives guidance and advice and oftentimes aren't even designated a mentor. When you have a mentor, it's not always like, hey, mentor. It's just the person, right, who you go to for guidance and they, maybe they were a previous boss and you've kept in touch and they continue to give you guidance and advice. When I have a career decision, there's like two or three people I, I call, right? Those could be called mentors, but oftentimes you don't even actually use that word, but that's what they are. Sponsors are usually within your company usually um, your boss or another executive that's probably higher up than you that will advocate for your advancement in a tangible way in the meetings that you're not in um, and help deliver to you tangible career advancement, whether that's promotion or pay. Um, and oftentimes the point that's made in the episode in the panel that we had last week, most times that's men because men hold most of the leadership roles in tech. Um, I think all of the women on the panel said they've never worked for a woman. I have, um, but a lot of women haven't um, in the tech space. So uh, male allies is something that we focus on in the episode and, uh, and, and a lot of them end up being our sponsors. Yeah, and like you said, right, male um, at the top, they're the most influential to provide those opportunities. And those are the people that you, they, you know, you would like them to talk about you when you're not in the meeting, to give you right. those opportunities, right, to, you know, to say, hey, I'm going to have this important meeting. Maybe you can come along with me and you can shadow that person. Um, and I agree. There's, and that's, a, that's where we're trying to go into strategic measurement. We're trying to come up with other things that are, have more uh, tangible opportunity for women to grow and a sponsorship program should be something that it needs to be created and formalized internally at our corporations right so that's something that I agree I haven't really learned much from other companies that are doing this and that's something that I, at my company was trying to evaluate and, and see if there's an opportunity here uh, Great, going back good. going back to the question you thought the, the, the male ally right let's go back to Guy Martin's story because that was in the episode two, um, of feeling attacked for being part of the problem and later realizing that those privileges didn't diminish any personal struggles. It shows that it is important to be aware of those definitions. So maybe if you can kind of share what are those definitions, what is white privilege and how do you think we can connect with male allies, right? And what is the role of male leadership? Well, Guy's story um, is, it's interesting. It was, a, I think I, I've mentioned before, we wanted to include male allies in the episode because men are a part of the women in tech community, but we wanted to be really sensitive because different groups of women have different views on the role that, that men should play in these communities. And Guy had a story he was willing to share. He was willing to be vulnerable in front of our cameras, so props to him, um, about getting pissed off about a reaction he got when he thought he was supporting the women in tech community. He had, it, for those that you didn't see the episode, just briefly, he went to a women in tech meeting, he was there, he tried to answer a question and he was called out for being part of the problem because he was a white male. Um, and so he got angry and left the meeting, um, but went on a personal journey of self-discovery to understand what privilege means. And he um, was raised in a, in a poor household. He had to put himself through school. He flunked some of his classes, had to retake some of them. Um, and so he felt like he had had struggle and that he didn't have privilege, but he soon found out through proactively seeking out women and minorities in his, you know, in his community, again, community, right? Um, in his network um, and talking to them and having very real authentic conversations. He started to realize, like you said, that his, his privilege didn't mean that he didn't have his own struggle, but he did have privilege and how, and it, it was, a, he, he had a responsibility to use that privilege for good and to understand what that looked like and what that meant. Um, so I think there's a, I guess, I, I don't know that I wanted to define exactly what white privilege is because everybody has a different definition of that. Um, but I think that, and I, but I think that Guy was able to define what that meant for him and how, how understanding that and being self-aware of that was a, allowed him to actually be a real part of the women in tech community. And he is, he is. That's awesome. Um, Katie, we have about, you know, five more minutes. Uh, any more questions from the audience to ask so, the last question to Jennifer? 
we have a lot of comments. We have a good conversation going here. Um, I had mentioned earlier on when we were talking about um, like having children and leaving, like she just made a good point about how in the U.S. when women go on maternity leave, it's considered short-term disability and how that in itself is just not right. I've always thought that. Right voice. Um, and then Lisa was kind of giving us some background from the UK's perspective. Their, their background on for maternity leave is very different than ours. So that was really interesting. They get like an entire year uh, of time off. Um, so there's just a really good conversation in the chat right now going along those different things. Um, All right. Uh, so I will, I will la ask my, the last question just to wrap it up and move to the, um, you know, closing remarks. So Jennifer, if you can provide a recommendation, how do we can help to the progress on our day-to-day -day, uh, work, right, as a community? And what is next for the Chasing Grace project? So advice in your day-to-day -day work. I mean, you know, we could do a roundtable on this. We all have experience and 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 um, and are doing different things in our day-to-day -day jobs. But I guess mine is just for me, making space for voices, making space for other voices. Um, for me, it was creating a platform where those voices could be heard. And so, you know, find, find, you know, I think we, there's those exercises you do in workshops, right? Like what's your superpower? We all have them, you know, understand and be aware of what your superpower is, know your purpose, define what that is for you. Maybe it changes year to year. Um, and how can you uniquely contribute to being an advocate for yourself? and for the women around you. And there's lots of ways to do that. And I know that all of us are doing that in different ways, but I think those three kind of focus areas can help you figure out how can I, what do I have to offer? Cause we all have something to offer and something we can do. Um, the Chasing Grace Project actually is going to conclude with episodes one through three. We're going to expand the platform um, into, a, into a new platform called the Story Changes Culture platform. Um, the Chasing Grace tagline was Story Changes Culture. We want to expand the scope of the project. It kind of got us started. We want to expand the scope of the project to include not just women in tech, but of women across all workplaces, because what we found is the experiences that we're having are not unique to tech. They are universal and they're happening too often. Uh, we also want to explore um, the intersectionality, right, of women of color and women of different socioeconomic backgrounds. And so um, we've been doing that along the way with the Chasing Grace Project, but under a banner of Story Changes Culture, we can do a lot more. So we will continue to film episodes. We will do a podcast. I'm going to be announcing a book club. All of you will get an invitation. I want to just create as many forums as possible under that banner where women can share their stories and connect. That's awesome. That's great. That's what we need. We need to continue with, uh, you know, amplifying the voices and working together, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to thank you, uh, Jennifer, mm. and I'm going to go back to the um, sharing my thank screen. You. So we can... Thanks, everybody, <laughs> for your questions and engagement. It's been such a great chat. I've learned a lot, a lot of things, which I, I like. Katie, I'll pass it to you. Okay. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, we were super excited about this. You know, we saw the Chasing Grace project, and our goal is to build community. So we were just so excited to do this this session. Um, we wanted to kind of end with just ways to connect with us. Obviously, the South Florida Anita B community. Um, that's our info. That's our email address. Actually, if you want to connect with us, you can join us on Mobilize, which is the new platform for Anita B to connect with the community groups. And then there's our hashtags you can follow us at. And I wanna encourage you guys, please feel free to reach out to any of us, connect with us. I know Jennifer had mentioned, you know, if anyone has any great stories, you can always connect with her on LinkedIn. You know, her goal, she said she's the storyteller. She wants to get the stories out there. So feel free to connect with her on LinkedIn also. Um, and as Ruth mentioned, we will send a follow up with uh, her LinkedIn profile information and any information from today's session. So everyone will have that readily available to them. Oh yeah, so Jennifer shared with us this, uh, this great quote. Jennifer, you wanna go ahead and read it? Since it came from you? Sure, we know that story changes culture, but it's a long game. That's why all of us must continue to share. Please share your stories with your friends, your family, your colleagues, and your communities. The experience will change you and it will change all of us. Yeah, that's a perfect way to end today's session. So thank you for that. Yes.
Thank you. Join, um, we recorded the session, so we'll go ahead and put it on any to be a uh, YouTube channel. So if you guys want to share this, I know Sarah talked about, you know, connecting with her students. Um, feel free to share this with them. We'll continue to host more virtual sessions and connect with the community. So again, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon.